If you wanna start wholesaling real estate and make life-changing money, this video is for you. I'm Adriel and I've done over 100 real estate deals and I've made six figures in a year, in a month, and even in a week. I have nine years of experience in real estate. I'm gonna share and break down all the steps you need to start wholesaling real estate yourself. Part one, where to get data. So data is the most important component of your real estate business. If you don't have quality data, you won't be getting quality leads, which means you won't be getting deals. Finding motivated sellers is the key to getting a deep discount on a property. And motivated sellers have a higher probability coming from a list of some kind of distress rather than a general list. To find these distressed lists, I'm gonna break down the best sources to get them. The better quality your data, the more motivated your seller. In turn, there's more possibility of getting good leads in your pipeline. If you don't pull data from the right sources, you're honestly just wasting money. The best place to get data is from your county. The county has the freshest data with the most motivated sellers. Write down these four terms and you're gonna to go to the county and request these lists. One, evictions, two, probate, three, divorce, and four, tax delinquent. So where exactly in the county can you find this data? Well, for evictions, probate cases, and divorce cases, you can find that in the civil court. In some states like Texas, evictions are processed in a separate court called the Justice of the Peace Courts. So you would just basically go to the court and ask for the court clerk and request this data. Now for tax delinquent properties, you're gonna to go to the county's tax assessor's office and the clerk for the tax assessor's office can provide you with a list of delinquent properties. When actually requesting this data, it's probably easier to do it online via email and you can write out in your email specifically what you're looking for. How I do mine is I request the previous month. So if it's December 1st, I will send an email saying, hello, can I please get a list of cases filed from November 1st to November 31st, 2021, 2022, whatever year you're in. And I ask for the probate cases filed, the eviction cases filed, and the divorce cases filed. Those of you that aren't aware, probate is when someone passes away and the heir is going to inherit their you know, estate and all that, it goes through a probate court. So what happens a lot of times is, say someone passes away and they leave a house behind, but the kids already live in a different state or a different city and they don't wanna come back to that house or make updates or repairs to sell it, they're willing to sell it at a discount just to get rid of it. For these three types of data, I request it normally on a monthly basis and then I can market that list every month. For tax delinquent properties, that's a little different. Tax delinquent properties are only delinquent once a year. So therefore, in Texas, come February 1st, properties are delinquent for the last year's taxes. So I always pull the tax delinquent list in February and I pull it once again in August. So I only pull it twice a year. You might be thinking, why would they just give away lists of divorces or probates? Those seem very personal. Well, according to the Freedom of Information Act, any governmental organization, all their records are public records. And the county is a local government and therefore anyone of the public can request this data and they must be provided this data by the county. So therefore, by law, this is public information that anyone can request and get. So don't be afraid to go ask for these things. Now, one thing you might come across is the person you're talking to at the county might not be familiar with the list you're wanting. If that's the issue, try to explain exactly what you want and if they still can't help you, ask to talk to a supervisor or ask to talk to someone else. So just don't be discouraged if the first person you talk to doesn't know what you're asking for and says, oh, we don't have that. They are required to give it to you by the Freedom of Information Act. You can quote that because they have a certain timeline they have to respond to you as well. I believe it's two weeks, they have to give you a response of some sort. Now, normally it costs a little bit of money to get this data from the county just to pay for um, their time, but it's very cheap. It's gonna be the cheapest source of data you can find. Uh, I know for some counties, just the probate list every month is eight bucks. While a tax CD on a bigger county is like $50. So anywhere from 10 to $50 is what you'll pay for this data. And it's really a small drop in the bucket for the quality of leads that you're gonna get. When you request this data, try to request it in an Excel file and try to request the following data. 
the owner's name, the owner's mailing address, and the property address. Those three things are what you need to do your marketing. And when I say owner's name, it means their full name. Their mailing address is their full mailing address. So the majority of my best deals have come from county data. I've been pulling county data ever since I started in 2016. It's given me the most consistent deal flow and I've made great profit spreads through this data. So this has to be your priority data to pull when you're starting out your real estate business. Now, before I move on to the second group of data, please make sure you like the video and subscribe if you want more real estate tips like this and finance tips and leave a comment below if you have questions about the county data so far. Now, the second group of data, once you've used up your county data, is more general data. Depending on where you live, your county might be too small to have consistent deal flow and enough leads to contact every month. That brings you to list source data. So list source is a very popular software that aggregates data uh, across the country and you can pay for lists to have leads to market to. Now, list source will be more expensive because you're paying per lead but it can filter out certain things to make it only the quality leads that you're marketing to. For example, the market I started in was a very small market and county data really only came out to be like 40 or 60 leads a month. You can blow through 40 or 60 leads in a day of marketing. So you need more leads to keep you busy throughout the month and keep you getting deals in your pipeline. So with list source, you can sign up and you can pull based on certain criteria. The two main lists I target on list source is absentee owner with high equity and then absentee owner unknown equity. Let me explain what this means. So an absentee owner basically means someone owns a house, but they're not living there. How can list source tell about this? Well, on all the county records on the county appraisal website, it shows the owner of a property, their mailing address, and then the property address. If their mailing address that they file with the county is different than the actual property address, they're an absentee owner. What this means is normally that house might be a second home, a vacation home, a rental property, basically anything but the house that they're living in. The reason we like that is they're more motivated to take a loss or give a discount selling that property compared to their own personal residence, right? They don't have to upend their life and move. There's no emotional attachment to the property as compared to maybe a residential home that they live in. And you're more likely to get a good deal. High equity means a person has a lot of equity in their property. What equity means is if they have a loan on the property or a mortgage, the balance of that mortgage is a lot lower to the actual value of the house. For example, if they bought a house 10 years ago for $200,000 and their mortgage at the time was $180,000, but now 10 years later, the house is worth $400,000 and the mortgage has been being paid down over 10 years, let's say it's down to $150,000 now. That means on a $400,000 house, they have a mortgage of only $150,000. That gives them an equity amount of $250,000. If they have the equity, you're more likely to get a better deal. Let's say they just wanna walk away with 50 grand and recruit what they paid for. You can pay them $200,000, they'll pay off the mortgage of 150, and then they'll pocket 50 grand, but then you can turn around and sell that property for $400,000 and make a six-figure profit. That's why you wanna target high equity properties. They have that room to negotiate and give you a big deal. Now, a lot of people know about the absentee owner high equity list right? Bigger Pockets talks about it. A lot of real estate gurus all talk about pulling this list. So you're going to have a lot more competition with this list. However, this second list that I pull has a lot less competition. This is the absentee owner unknown equity. So there's a filter on list source that filters for unknown equity. As smart as the algorithm is for list source to pull data, Sometimes they just can't pull a mortgage or a deed on a property that's maybe in a rural area or the record keeping was bad before it switched to online record keeping and it just can't figure out what the mortgage is on a property and what the equity is. When that happens, ListSource pushes that property to the category of unknown equity. In a lot of times, the data sitting in this unknown equity section could have a lot of high equity motivated sellers, but many investors overlook this and aren't taught this to pull this list and you have a gold mine sitting there 
of unknown equity properties that not many people are targeting. Less competition means you can get better deals. There's less bidding awards and there's less people reaching out to the seller making them think the property is worth more than it is. So definitely make sure to pull the unknown equity list as well as the high equity list so you can capture all the potential leads you can get. So there are a lot of different marketing methods, but the main ones are direct mail, cold calling, texting or SMS, ringless voicemail or RVM, PPC, SEO, Facebook ads, TV ads, and radio ads. Now I'll give a brief overview of each one and then I'll dive into the ones that I use in my business. So direct mail is when you send out letters or postcards to property owners asking if they're interested in selling their property. This method is less work as it is an inbound form of marketing, which means you send out marketing and you wait for sellers to call you. The good thing about this is when it's an inbound marketing, the leads are usually warm and are motivated somewhat to sell, otherwise they wouldn't contact you. Cold calling, on the other hand, is an outbound method of marketing. It's more work as you're proactively reaching out to sellers, even if they might not want to sell. So you're going to get a lot more no's and cold answers versus hot, warm leads in inbound marketing. SMS and ringless voicemail are also the same as cold calling. You're going to be doing outbound proactive marketing. So ringless voicemail, for those who don't know, is when you automatically just leave a voicemail on someone's phone. Their phone won't ring. They'll just see a new voicemail in their inbox. Hence, it's called ringless voicemail. So this can be done with systems in mass to a lot of leads and a lot of phone numbers. And it's a good way to do marketing as someone will say, oh, I got a voicemail, I must have missed a call. And they'll listen to the voicemail and see that you're asking if they wanna sell a property. SEO is when you have a website and you rely on search engine optimization. So when people Google search how to sell their home in your market, your website will pop up and you'll have a convincing website on why they should sell to you. And they'll reach out to you through your website intake form. PPC kind of goes off SEO, but PPC you actually pay for ads to rank higher on Google. PPC can get expensive as you're paying per click which is the name of PPC, and it redirects them to your website where they can also do a reach out and you get inbound form of marketing. Facebook ads, I don't know as many people that do it, but I do know some that do it and it works, and it's almost the same thing as Google ads or any other ads. You just pay for an advert space that will be shown on people's Facebook feeds asking if they wanna sell their house. Radio ads are a little different where you're negotiating with radio companies to buy airspace to advertise on the radio. You actually record an audio advertisement and they'll play that recording during certain times during the day. That's the same with TV ads. You record a video advertisement and you send it to the TV companies and the channels and they'll play your ads between shows or commercial breaks, etc. So it doesn't really matter which marketing channel you pick. You can be successful with any of those marketing channels. What I recommend is just to pick one and become a master at it first before you decide to try another marketing method. That means give it a good six months and proactively tweak things until you figure it out and try it for six months and analyze your results before you decide, okay, I'm gonna try a different method or I'm gonna go all in on this method. And a lot of it will boil down to your budget and your daily to day needs. Do you have a full-time job and you don't have the time to do the marketing? Then you might want an inbound form of marketing such as direct mail or SEO. When I first started in 2016, all I did was direct mail marketing. And I did that for a good two to three years and did very well for me. It is a little more expensive, but at the time, that was the cheapest option that I had available. Now, cold calling is my primary source of marketing. It's easier to scale and I like to be proactive and reach out to sellers instead of waiting on them to contact me. But like I said, it all depends on your budget and your schedule. So some of the keys for direct mail is to have multiple contacts. What that means is if you get a list of motivated sellers, don't just mail that list one time or two times and expect results. You need to send mail and contact that list five to six times. Statistics show that the majority of the responses will come after the fourth mailing. So how that would look like is if you had a list of leads, I would send a letter or a postcard every month for six months to that same list before you take off that list and stop marketing it. And that doesn't mean send the same letter or postcard five to six times. Each time you send them a postcard or a letter, switch it up. So maybe the first time you can send a more formal letter, the second time you can send a postcard, and then change up the type of message you're sending in the postcard. The first one should be the generic, hey, I'm interested in your property at 123 Main Street, which considers selling to a cash offer. The second one, you can maybe throw in a testimonial about your company. If you're new and you haven't done any deals before, don't worry about that. You can just tweak your message in different ways. But what I do on one of my second mailings is I put a testimonial of a person I've helped through this direct mail marketing 
and the process and everything they went through and it gives you more credibility and the seller feels more comfortable picking you to sell their home. Also, another tip is to always leave your phone number and your email on the postcard or letters and let them know they can call, text, or email you. Some people just have a fear of talking on the phone with strangers and they won't wanna call, so they'll text or email. Some people, they wanna keep everything in writing on the computer through email as it's more of a business transaction. So these are great ways to reach people that might not contact you back if it was just a phone number to call. The next thing is you're gonna need a good inbound process for these leads. You don't know what time of day they're gonna reach out to you. And if you're busy and have a full-time job, you might miss some of these things. So when I started out, I just had a Google Voice and I put that Google Voice number on my postcards and letters. So they could text or call and leave voicemails to that Google Voice. And if I was busy, I would miss it, but then I'd come back when I had time and call them back. What I eventually moved on to was a live answering service. So whenever they call the number on the postcard or letter, it gets routed to a 24 seven live answering service and they talk to a real person based here in the United States. That answering service can then ask pre-qualifying questions such as the address, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, the price they're wanting, and send that all to you in an email and that gives you a head start on analyzing the lead. Direct mail is a great option if you have a full-time job or you're very busy because it doesn't take much time and it's more reactive. You're waiting for motivated sellers to contact you. It's more of an inbound marketing method so you're gonna get more motivated sellers instead of a lot of cold and no's. It's an inbound method of marketing, so you're gonna get motivated sellers reaching out to you. Now, the software I like to use to automate all this is called Click to Mail. With Click to Mail, you can upload a list, create your templates for your postcards and letters, and then just send them out and they'll do all the mailings for you. This way you don't have to hand write any letters or go actually put stamps on a letter and mail it out yourself physically. It's all done on the website and it saves you a lot of time. So my main marketing method right now is cold calling. And this goes back to the first part of the series where I talked about how to get data. And when you request your data, you need the owner's name, owner's mailing address, and the property address. Well, with this information, you can upload it to several providers that do skip tracing. What skip tracing is, is they take the information like the owner's name and address, and they look up their phone number and give that to you. So you have a phone number to reach out and contact. So some providers I like to use are batchskiptracing.com, or REI Skip. There's plenty of them out there. Just find one that you like and use them. Once you send it to these skip tracing sites, they'll send you back a file with phone numbers and emails for every single one of the leads. Now that you have a skip trace list, you're gonna upload it to a dialing system. So when I first started cold calling, I was using a dialer called Mojo Dialer. I think this is the best one for beginners to start out with. It's very intuitive, it's easy to use, and it's still a powerful tool and it's not too expensive and it's just overall great for a beginner or one or two VAs to call with. On these dialers, you can upload the list and it can dial three, four, five numbers at a time. So if you have a big list of several thousand leads, you can go through and call those owners in a much more efficient and quick manner than hand dialing one by one on a phone. The dialer I use now is Ready Mode and there's other ones such as Call Tools or Batch Dialer. Just pick one that you like and you're like the interface because they all kind of do the same function anyways. So it doesn't really matter. It's not like one is that much better than the other. It's just all preference. So I'll just pick one, learn it, master it, and just keep running with it. In my opinion, this is a lot cheaper than direct mail because instead of paying per lead, you're just paying monthly for a dialer and as much as you can dial, you can is as many leads you can get through. While direct mail, you have to pay per lead for an envelope and a stamp to mail it out. I also like cold calling because it's a proactive approach. I'm actively going out and asking people if they wanna sell instead of sitting back and waiting for them to come to me. This way I can maybe beat someone that has sent a letter, but that person is busy, they just haven't gotten time to respond back to the letter. But if I constantly call them and text them, hey, do you wanna sell, hey, do you wanna sell? They'll be more likely to sell to me because they see that I'm so persistent and I'm reaching out to them. And that way it can probably steal leads from other investors as you're more proactive in getting the deal. You do need to manage the phone numbers you're calling with because phone carriers like Verizon and AT&T are getting a lot smarter now and they will flag your number as spam if you dial too fast or too many numbers off the phone number. They have an algorithm to detect auto dialers like the ones we use and they'll flag your number as spam and most people won't pick up a number that says potential spam. I know I don't. So one thing you have to do is monitor your numbers and make sure you change them out frequently so they don't get flagged as spam. And even some carriers, they don't even let the phone ring. It just gets straight to voicemail or it doesn't even show up on their phone at all if you're a spam number. So it's very important not to waste your money on your leads and your data 
by not letting your phone calls go through. The next marketing method I use is SMS or texting. I don't really use much of this. It's a very small portion of my marketing and I just use it for very specific lists. But basically that's just sending text messages out to owners. It's almost like cold calling. It's an outbound proactive approach, but it's a very cheap alternative. And what you do is you just use an SMS system. I use batch SMS. Basically you can create a bunch of templates on your messages and it can send out in mass text messages to your list. I recommend having 10 to 20 different text templates and then keeping them in a rotation when you send out text messages. Play around with sending messages at different times of the day in different templates and just monitor your response rate. Monitor the delivery rate. Are some words in your templates getting flagged as spam and they're not getting delivered? Or is there some kind of template where it invokes a reaction where they respond more? So you have to play around and look at your numbers and pick templates that work the best for your SMS marketing. Like I said, this is a very small portion of our marketing because in 2021, a lot of the carriers released new rules on spam texting and the penalties. So a lot of that has gone down significantly in terms of the volume of people doing SMS texting. Now the last marketing channel I use is SEO. This stands for search engine optimization. Basically I created a website and I've optimized it for when people search on how to sell their homes fast, it'll come to my website and they can see my website, see the deals I've done, see the testimonials of previous clients, and they'll be more inclined to want to sell their house with me. So SEO is fairly new in my business and it takes time to really build up the credibility, but I've gotten two deals off of it so far and it's made my money's worth. So SEO is something to consider. It's an inbound method, it's more passive. You can do that if you don't have a lot of time, like a full-time job. So keep that in mind. If you wanna go the SEO route, I just suggest paying someone on Upwork or Fiverr to create your website for you. I recommend using carrot website templates, those for some reason SEO higher. And then on your website itself, put testimonials of clients you've dealt with that you've bought the properties and they were happy. Put pictures and videos of yourself that helps build credibility. Keep in mind SEO is in the long game. Just because you create a website doesn't mean you'll start getting leads next month. It takes time in Google's algorithm to rank higher on the search page. So don't expect deals until maybe one to two to three years out, but do it for the long game and you won't regret it. So that's a quick breakdown of all the marketing methods you can use out there for your real estate business and the ones I use in my business. Like I said, the ones I use might not be the best fit for you. Research each of them above and then look at your budget and your schedule and pick one that will fit those two items and stick to it for at least six months and really focus on that one channel and you'll start to see some results. So in order to even determine if a deal is a good deal or not, you need to know how much the property is worth. This comes down to your location. There are certain states in the United States that are disclosure states and some are non-disclosure states. What this means is in a disclosure state, the sales price of a property is public information and anyone can see it. In a non-disclosure state, the sales price of a property is private and it's not available for the public to see. The 12 states that are non-disclosure states are Texas, Alaska, Idaho, Kansas, Missouri, Mississippi, Louisiana, Wyoming, Utah, North Dakota, New Mexico, and Montana. If you're investing in any of those 12 states, your first priority is to network with realtors or become a realtor yourself so you can gain access to the MLS. The MLS is called the Multiple Listing Services. That's where licensed realtors can post properties for sale and licensed realtors can see what other properties have sold for. Having MLS access is the only way in a non-disclosure state for you to check sales prices of similar properties in order to evaluate the value of your property. The best way to do this if you don't wanna get your real estate license is to network with other realtors. Now the realtors you wanna target are newer realtors that recently got their license. They tend to be hungrier to work harder to get more deals as they are new. Most new realtors start out as buyer's agents. What that means is they try to help people find a home to purchase. However, most agents want to be listing agents or seller agents. This is a lot easier as all you do is list a property for sale and let the buyers come to you. So most people want that role instead of a buyer's agent and they can also build up their portfolio of houses they've listed and sold and that gives them more credibility. Essentially, it's a lot less work to be a seller's agent and they still make the same amount of commissions. However, most realtors don't know how to generate their own leads and find listings. This is where you can come in and provide value. You can help create a win-win situation for both yourself and the agent. So how I would pitch it to an agent is, 
I would say, hey, I'm a local real estate investor and I plan on scaling up my marketing in the near future. I'll be getting a lot of leads and I know most of them won't meet my criteria as an investor to buy. However, they could be asking a very reasonable price that should sell relatively quickly on the market. If you can partner with me and provide me your MLS access, I can refer you all these leads I get that don't fit my criteria that can be great listings for you. This will help you make more money help you build up your portfolio. And if you give me access to your MLS, I don't have to bug you every hour on running comps for me. I can run comps on myself. And how this can also benefit the buyer's agent is you can pre-qualify leads for them so they're all warm leads. Let them know that. Tell them, hey, instead of wasting your time running comps to see if a seller that wants to sell is gonna be a good listing or not, I do all that work up front as I filter out deals for my own criteria. So I'll send you warm leads that I've already ran comps on that I know should sell quickly on the market. And if you pitch it the right way, a newer realtor is not gonna turn that offer down because it helps them tremendously and it'll benefit you as an investor as well. So back on determining how much a property is worth, what you have to do is look at sales comparables. What that means is you look at comparable homes that recently sold in the same area as your subject property that you're analyzing. So there's different criteria, but how I like to run my comps is this. The first criteria I like to use when running comps is square footage. I like to compare to properties with similar square footage that has sold recently. So how this works is, if the subject property that I got from a lead for my marketing is a house that is 1500 square feet, I like to go plus or minus 150 square foot above and below that amount. So on the MLS, when I'm filtering for the sold properties, I'll put a range on the square footage from 1350 square feet to 1650 square foot. What this does is any properties within that range will show up on my search results. And those properties will all be within 150 square foot of my subject house of 1500 square feet. The next criteria I look at when running comps is the age of the property. I like to compare houses that are built within 10 years of the same age as my subject property. So for example, if the house I'm analyzing was built in 2000, I'll make my age range for homes built between 1990 and 2010. This way I'm not looking at houses built in the 1950s or new construction homes built in 2018, 2020, because those aren't accurate comparisons to the house I'm looking at. My next criteria is location. I like to start out with the zip code and go on the map view and then zoom in to the exact neighborhood the house is in. The reason I do this is I don't like to cross any major streets or highways. So in the same zip code, you could have a highway running through it or a major street that divides it up. And a lot of times what happens is one side of that highway might be a more desirable area and the other side of the highway might be a worse neighborhood, but it's all the same zip code. And those two things can drastically change the value of a house if it's on one side or the other of the highway. Another thing is I don't like crossing major streets because a lot of times cities and counties use major streets and highways to put out boundaries for stuff such as school districts. So you can be in the same zip code in the same city, but one side of a major street might be zoned to a less desirable school and the other side of the street might be zoned to a much more desirable school district. And this can drastically affect values as home buyers want to buy and pay more for a home in a good school district. The last thing to keep note of is just if the house is on a major street or not. If it's on an actual major street and goes right up against it, you have to make it a lower value than other comps because it's a lot less desirable. Don't worry if you struggle on running comps at first. It's more of an art and it's not an exact science because at the end of the day, the value of a home is how much someone will pay for it. Someone might like a design of a home more than another buyer and they could pay more for it. So it's not an exact number or an exact reasoning, you have to look at the overall statistics to see how valuable a house might be. But with enough practice, you'll start to feel comfortable, but it could take a year or two years to really hone down those skills on running comps. For disclosure states where it's public information, you should be able to see recently sold values on Zillow or Redfin. Now, if you're in a non-disclosure state, you need to get MLS access to be able to see these sales comps. If this has been helpful to you so far, please like the video and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below if you have any further questions. So once you figure out what a property is worth, the next thing you have to figure out is how much will it cost to renovate the property to that level for it to sell at that price that it's worth. 
This is a very tough subject because even in the same market, rehab costs can vary drastically. For example, a house might cost me $70,000 to do a full gut HGTV rehab, but for a new investor or for someone else that doesn't speak Spanish maybe, it might cost them $90,000 for the same rehab. As you can see, rehab costs really depend on your connections with your contractors. Someone like me who has contractors that work for me for multiple years give me better pricing than a new investor. But don't let that set you back. The best way to move forward is just to take action. Here's what I recommend you do to start learning the rehab costs of properties in your market. First thing I would do is to look up three contractors in your area. Reach out to them and let them know you're a real estate investor and you plan to have a long-term relationship and do a lot of flips over the upcoming years. Next, go on Zillow or the MLS and look up fixer upper homes. Look for homes that need renovation work that are being sold as is. Then contact the listing agent and ask you if you can schedule an appointment to walk the property and that you're an interested buyer and investor in the area. What you'll then do is reach out to those three contractors that you've gotten their info and tell them to meet you at the property on the day of the walkthrough. Have them walk through the property with you and ask them questions on what needs to be done to get it up to a renovated level. Then ask for them to send you a bid, a line item bid for each item that you're gonna fix over to you. What this does is you'll start to understand how much it costs more or less to renovate a property. Look at several different homes. Look at homes that just need a cosmetic update and look at homes that need a full gut renovation. That way you can learn how much each thing costs in a ballpark range after you practice enough. For example, after you walk maybe five or six homes with three or four different contractors, you'll start getting a ballpark range. Okay, a brand new kitchen remodel will cost me anywhere from three to $4,000. Or a brand new bathroom remodel will be anywhere from four to 5,000. You'll start getting ballpark ideas and ballpark numbers on each renovation cost so that when you start analyzing your deals, you'll be able to more accurately put in a total number for the rehab cost. This is in my opinion, the best and lowest risk way to learn about rehab costs. I wish I did this when I started. How I started was I just bought a full gut rehab and started getting contractors and I learned the prices after I bought the home. I don't recommend you do that. You could lose money doing that. So I learned from my mistakes and now I recommend to others is to do this method I just explained in order to learn the rehab costs in a safe way. Once you know what a house is worth and how much it will cost to renovate it, it's very simple to come up with the offer price. So the equation is your offer price is equal to the after repair value of the home or the ARV minus the renovation costs minus the amount of profit you want to make. So if a house is worth $300,000 and the renovation will cost $50,000 and you want to make $50,000, then what I would offer is at most $200,000 because 300 minus 50 minus 50 is 200. However, I would actually start even lower than that. I would start at like 160 or $170,000 just so you have some wiggle room to negotiate up with the seller or best case, they take your first offer and you can make even more profits. Honestly, it just takes some practice to get comfortable. So just keep practicing these skills. Once you practice enough on how to run comps, how to look at rehab costs, you'll be more confident in making an offer to sellers. So that wraps up how you can start analyzing deals. Without a signed contract, there is no deal. You legally have to have a binding purchase and sale agreement between you and the seller and have both your signatures on it. For the contract itself, you can either use your real estate contract or you can have your own contract. Here in Texas, we have TREC or the Texas Real Estate Contract. It's a 13 page document that's very thorough and extensive. However, when we're doing wholesaling or flipping and buying these properties cash, a lot of that document doesn't really apply to us as there's no realtors involved and it's a cash transaction. So a lot of times this can get confusing for sellers to have to go through and initial and sign 13 different pages. So what we do instead is we have our own two page contract that just breaks it down to the essential items. Basic things you need in any contract to be a legitimate real estate contract are the following. You need the parties of the contract, the seller's name, and the buyer's name. You need the legal description of the property. This can be found on the county appraisal district. You'll need the address of the property. You also need the purchase price, the earnest money amount, and the closing date of the transaction. The next thing you'll need is a special provisions line item where it's blank and you can fill in any kind of special provisions that are specific to that transaction. Next, you'll have to specify which title company will be handling the file. And we usually add in a line item that says we are purchasing the property in as is condition. After that, it's really just basic legal jargon that's in almost every contract. It's much simpler and easier for a seller to read and understand 
this two page contract versus the 13 page state contract. So those points I made above are really all you need in a purchase contract for real estate. If you want, you can Google wholesaling real estate contract template or example, and you can just copy that and tweak it to your market or to your liking. And if you want peace of mind, you can pay a lawyer for a few hours of their time to review the contract to make sure everything is good. For me, I like to send everything online via DocuSign. I like electronic signatures. It's just smoother for my business process and a lot quicker. But sometimes a seller that's older or not as good with technology will need to sign on paper and you can just print out the contract and meet the sellers and sign it as well. So be flexible and cater to your sellers. Some optional items you can put in the contract depending on how you want to structure it, is an option fee for an option period. An option period basically allows you to back out of the contract for any reason within that time frame. But that option fee you pay up front to the seller is non-refundable. You're basically giving the seller a little bit of money so that you have a window where you can back out for any reason. So a lot of wholesalers like to do this so they can back out if they can't find a buyer for the property. However, this is not required for the contract to be legal and for it to go through. It's just an option you can build in if you want some protection for yourself as a wholesaler. I won't be going over an example contract here because every state is different and everyone has different contracts and terminology. So it wouldn't really help the majority of people if I just went over one state's contract. Another way is you can ask a local title company what's the most common contract or what contracts they see the most often being used and request a copy of those. And to my next point, make sure you check out this video next, which will go over the next step in the process, which is how to pick a title company to handle the entire transaction. So once you have a signed contract with the seller, you need to turn in the contract to a title company or to an attorney for attorney-based closing states. Now, there's tons of title companies out there, but not all of them are investor friendly. How you can find a title company is just start by Googling title companies in your area. Once you find three or four title companies, you wanna ask them some questions. The main things you wanna ask are, do you guys do assignments of contracts for wholesaling real estate? And how often do you do these? Do you do blind HUDs? A blind HUD is where the sellers can't see the buyer side of the transaction and the buyers can't see the seller side of the transaction. What this does is a buyer won't be able to see your assignment fee and how much you're making, but the seller still will do this. A lot of times this is good if you don't want a buyer to see how much more they're paying without having to do a double close. So seeing if a title company does blind HUDs can be important in the future. The next thing you wanna ask is, how long does it normally take to get a title commitment back? Normally it should be around two weeks. If they're any longer than this, that's kind of a red flag that they're slow and they're just not gonna work out for you long-term because time kills all deals. Ask them if they work with a lot of investors. If they work with a lot of investors, then there's a good chance that they know all the things you wanna do in wholesaling and they'll be able to guide you and work with you pretty efficiently. Another thing you wanna ask and just double check is do they order surveys? So most title companies can order a survey and get quotes for you, but some of the smaller ones or more rural locations, they don't do that. And it's not the end of the world if they don't, but it's just more work on your end. You wanna to try to hire everything out that you can to the title company. Let them handle the transaction. Because if you're scaling, you don't have time to order surveys for five or six different deals going on at the same time. Have the title company order the surveys and just put the price of that on the HUD. Another thing that should be common with all title companies is mobile notaries and mobile closings. They should be able to schedule a mobile notary to do the closing at a remote location. If, for example, if a seller lives out of state, they're not gonna fly in just to sign closing documents on the house. You can make it easier for the seller by having the title company send out a mobile notary to wherever they are to sign the documents. Like I said, most title companies can do this, but I've come across some very smaller title companies in more rural areas where they haven't been able to do this. For example, I just recently wholesaled a deal in Searcy, Arkansas, and the title company in Searcy has never done a mobile closing. They don't know even where to look to schedule and order a mobile notary. We had to help the title company do that from our end as we aren't in Arkansas, but we still needed to sign documents to close. The last thing you wanna ask is if the title company can file a memorandum for you. So what a memorandum is, is essentially a document you file with the county government to protect your interest in the contract. This comes in handy when, say a seller gets a higher offer and they wanna back out of your contract and sell to someone else. Or if you're marketing the deal and the end buyer tries to be sleazy and cuts you out of the deal and goes behind your back to contact the seller, this memorandum protects your interest in the property so they can't do that to you and you still get paid. If this memorandum is filed, 
world, no other title company or attorney can close the deal without clearing your memorandum from the file for clear title. Now, some companies will do it for you, but some won't. This is more 50-50 because a lot of title companies see it as they're not being neutral anymore if they're filing a memorandum on your behalf. Their whole job is to be a neutral third-party coordinator of the transaction for a fair transaction. So if they're helping you file memorandums, it could be seen as they're leaning towards you more than the other party, which you know could be an issue. However, some will still do it for you because it's document work and filing legal documents for real estate with the county is what they do as a title company. So definitely ask if they do that. It's not the end of the world if they don't. You can file your own memorandums, but it goes back to the survey point. You want them to handle as much as the transaction as possible to take the load off your back so you can scale and do more deals. Seeing how they respond to those questions I mentioned above will give you a good indicator on whether or not they'll be a good title company for a wholesaling investor or any type of real estate investor. If they can do most of the things I mentioned above, they're probably worth the shot. You can try a deal or two with them. What I recommend is trying several different title companies with different deals and seeing the ones that you like to work with. Every title company has a different procedure, a different way of handling files. And the one that works the best with how you operate your business is the one you want to stick with and give your business to. For example, in one of my markets in Houston, I was with a title company for maybe two years, a large nationwide title company. And eventually they became too slow and I wasn't getting the attention I needed for my deal. And I had to bounce around to two or three different title companies before I ended up at the one I'm with now that is perfect and works very efficiently and they treat me like a VIP. In between that time, I had a title company pull the title commitment for the wrong property. I sent a contract with the correct legal description and address and they pulled the title commitment of the house next door. So once I saw that, that was a huge red flag. I stopped working with that title company. It was just that one deal. And even that deal, I didn't even finish it with that title company. I ended up going to another title company and reopening title on that same deal just because I couldn't trust that other company if they pulled the title work for the wrong house. And once again, speed is the name of the game. So you want a title company that can work with you and be able to get title commitments cleared in a timely manner. Normally this will be your smaller title companies that aren't big nationwide chains. The reason for this is there's less red tape with these smaller title companies. The underwriters with the big title companies normally have such a big workload that they're always behind and they can't get to yours within a week or two. They have to go through all the other files that the title company has. If you have a smaller title company that handles less volume, their underwriters won't be as busy and they can turn around title commitments as quick as one week, sometimes even less. So therefore, I would try to find a smaller title company and building a good relationship with them. Another thing you want to look for is to see if they're bilingual. Depending on your market, this could be a huge deal. In Texas, there's a lot of Spanish speaking people. So if you have a title company that can speak fluent Spanish as well, this can help greatly when you need to explain things to a seller that only speaks Spanish in terms of complicated real estate jargon or legal terminology in a contract. It's not a necessity, it's not a requirement, but if your market has a dominant Spanish speaking or another language, try to find a title company that can speak that language as well and it can make things smoother for the times you have sellers that speak that language. So now you have the basics to find a good real estate investor friendly title company. Make sure you try a few, but make sure you finally pick one to do all your business with to build that relationship. So you're now almost at the finish line. The last step is to find an end buyer to sell the deal to, and then you can make your money. For me, I would only find that the buyer is one of the easier parts of the process as there are lots of cash buyers out there if it's a good deal. The first place you should look is Facebook real estate groups. I think this is the number one best way to find an end buyer. So basically what you do is you go on Facebook and you'll search up your city plus real estate investors or real estate investment, and you'll join the Facebook groups in your city. For example, I'm in Houston, and if you search Houston real estate investors or Houston real estate investing. There's about four main real estate groups for the Houston area. Join all your groups and start posting your deals in there and you'll get buyers. What will happen is people start commenting on your posts or they'll directly message you on Facebook. One thing to keep in mind though, since you don't really know the people in these groups, don't post the full address of your property. Just post maybe a zip code or a neighborhood and then post some basic details. And when they reach out to you for more information, that's when you want to vet them and make sure they're actually an end buyer and not another wholesaler. You can also vet them when you look at their Facebook profile and you can maybe even ask for a proof of funds. This way you can weed out the serious buyers from the tire kickers or people that might try to steal your property and buy it straight from the seller. Another place to find an end buyer is in your local real estate meetup groups. I think this is a good way to find buyers because you can meet them face 
face to face and build that rapport and connection with them and kind of vet them out and see your gut feeling about the person. This brings you a lot more trust and confidence in a buyer that can perform if you've met them in person and talked to them and see what they're doing. Now, it's not as scalable because there's not gonna be that many people in a meetup group, but it's definitely a good way to get a more qualified buyer you feel good about. I recommend going to several different meetups just to meet a variety of investors in your area. And also, just because one person might not be a buyer for your type of deal, they might know other legitimate buyers that can perform that might be interested in your zip code or in your deal. Another good way to find buyers is right on the MLS. On the MLS, you can look up recently sold homes around your subject property and see who paid cash for them. If those people that paid cash are normally investors, you can call the buyer's agent that was on that deal and ask them if their client is interested in another similar property in the same area. Most of the times they will be interested and you'll know how much they will pay for it because you can see what they pay for the one nearby. I've done this numerous times and found a lot of buyers and moved a lot of deals this way. For me, it's more of a sure thing because you've seen that they've bought this property on the MLS that you know they can perform and they can actually close the deal. Second, it saves you the time of blasting it on Facebook, talking to a lot of tire kickers and people that are interested, when you can find serious buyers who buy in that area and that type of property right there on the MLS. Now, I prefer to buy it from cash buyers. You can see on the recently sold comps nearby how they bought the property. Was it cash? Was it a VA loan? Was it a conventional loan? So that can kind of help determine if they're an investor more than let's say just a person buying a retail house. So definitely don't sleep on that. Definitely look at recently sold properties near your property and see if there are any cash buyers and reach out to that agent and they'll normally make a deal of you and their client will buy yours too. If this video series so far has been giving you great information, please like the video and subscribe to the channel so you can get more real estate tips to advance your real estate investing career. Now, the next place I like to find buyers from is the title company itself. Like the last video where we went over title companies, if you picked a real estate investor friendly title company, chances are they're working with other investors too. And they can see the ones that are consistently closing and buying deals. And you can ask them, hey, do you have any investors that you see always buying closing deals? Would they be interested in in my deal. And that way the real estate title companies can connect you to the end buyer. And you'll know that they are legitimate buyers and can close because the title company is seeing them every month closing and buying deals. So you won't have to worry about tire kickers or someone that can't perform as the title company already sees that they're legitimate buyers that they've worked with. Another benefit to this is the title company will already have their information, like their entity formation documents and any other required things that they need from a buyer. This can make a transaction go smoother and quicker when you do this route. So make sure to do all four of those tips above when finding your buyers, especially when you're starting out. You can't just rely on one of those methods. You have to do all four and start building up your buyers list until you have a good solid buyers list. Another way to do it is to swap a buyers list of other wholesalers. Tell them you'll send your buyers list to them if they send you their buyers list and that way you can add to your buyers list pretty quickly. If you watch this entire video, you've gotten plenty of gold nuggets and actionable steps you can take tomorrow. Don't hesitate, don't procrastinate, take action now and change your life. If you learned anything or got any value from this video, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more real estate content.